this talk is a harder one for me to get right. And I've relied on the advice of Jean Brichemont to check that what I'm saying is correct in this, and I want to thank him for that. I have been talking about classical materialism, starting from Lucretius, gradually working through Boltzmann, etc. Now, classical materialism had been based on the idea of the atom, the indivisible atoms. But in the 20th century, it was discovered that atoms could be split. What was the implication of this? It was discovered that there were smaller particles inside atoms. Does this matter for matter? Does it matter? if the atom turned out to be splittable, if the atom turned out to have a nucleus with electrons going around it? Did it matter if the nucleus was ter turned out to be made of neutrons and protons? And did it matter if these, in turn, were discovered to be made up of smaller particles? Way back in 1905, same year that Einstein published his paper on the Brownian motion, he published another paper on the photoelectric effect. This is what he actually got his Nobel Prize for. In, his en in essence, what he did was he showed that there were what you might call atoms of light. He showed that light was made up of particles, the particles which we now call photons. So, to the question I asked before, does it matter if it turned out that the atoms were not indivisible? No, it doesn't matter, because we're taking the word atom from Epicurus, or not from Epicurus, and in the 19th century, these were mapped onto the chemical elements, the atoms of the chemical elements. And that is what the word now means. But from the philosophical standpoint, from the standpoint of the basic theory of materialism, which Epicurus was putting forward, it doesn't matter whether these indivisible particles, these indivisible atoms, were what we now call atoms, or whether we regard these indivisible particles as being the photons, quarks and electrons that we now regard as indivisible. The basic idea which persists from Epicurus is that there are fundamental particles of matter out of which other things are made. Exactly what we call these doesn't matter. Why then was quantum theory which developed at the same time as the, it was discovered that the atom was splittable. Why was quantum theory seen as a challenge for materialism? There appeared to be a number of challenges here. The first is that the quantum theory seemed to involve non-determinism. It seemed to involve what was called a wave-particle duality. It involved the existence of non-local effects, which seemed hard to reconcile with the view of materialism. And it introduced, or was made to seem to introduce, an essential role for the observer, the human observer, in the world that was being observed. Well, let's look first at this issue of materialism versus non-determinism. The first point is that non-determinism isn't new. It was already dealt with in the statistical mechanics of Boltzmann, which reasoned about probabilities of things occurring rather than certainties. And at another level, whether or not atomic motions are deterministic or probabilistic doesn't really matter for materialism. And there is a further paradox here, that the wave equations of quantum mechanics evolved deterministically and linearly. 
was Newtonian mechanics being non-linear easily generates chaotic motion so that very small uncertainties in the motions of atoms treated as perfect billiard balls bouncing off one another rapidly generate complete uncertainty about the positions of atoms. Perhaps a harder problem is the wave-particle duality. Classical materialism had been based entirely on the idea that things were made out of particles. Insofar as waves were recognised, and they were began to be recognised in the 19th century for light and other electromagnetic effects, materialism attempted to explain these in terms of there being a very thin me medium, an ether, in which the light uh, propagated. But the, the existence of this ether had been disproved in the early or late 19th, early 20th century and had been dropped. So the duality between particles and, and uh, light continued to be seen as a problem. Now the simplest form of um, interference effect is one that you get if you shine a laser through two slits. You get a series of dots generated. You don't just get one dot or two dots. You get a row of dots generated by interference effects. And if you hold up a, a CD, for example, to the light and you've got a light source, you will see multiple images. If it's a small light source like an LED, you'll see multiple images generated by reflection in the same way as the uh, multiple images you get in a screen from a, a diffraction slit. So this is a, an easily observable phenomenon which you can see with uh, things which have are readily available to you nowadays. Now what's happening here is that the light is going through the slits and they're adding up and generating interference patterns on the far side. You're all taught about this in, in physics at school. It's just classical optics. But the odd thing is that this happens even if the light is so dim that only one photon at a time is being sent through. So it's very hard to reconcile this with a particle view. If the particle is passing through one slit, how does it interfere with the light coming through the other slit? So the first assumption one would make is maybe the particles don't exist, maybe only the wave exists. Or you might say maybe the particle actually goes through both of them. Now if it was just light, it wouldn't be so much of a problem, but it was found that electrons behave the same way. If you send an electron beam of the sort you have in an old-fashioned TV and you set it through a pair of slits, you would get a set of diffraction bands on the screen. How could this be reconciled with a materialist view of particles? The standard view that's given of this is the Copenhagen interpretation. A summary of it is given in this quote from Bohr that in contrast to ordinary mechanics the new quantum mechanics does not deal with a space-time description of the movement of atomic particles. The difficulties seem to require just that that renunciation of mechanical models in space and time which is so characteristic a feature of the new quantum mechanics. So there in 1934 Bohr seems to be saying we have to chuck out materialism because of these effects because we can't give a definite position to the particles as they go through slits and other similar circumstances. But in a sense this is just a recapitulation of Mach. In this variant the photon has no definite position until it's observed. But that's just a repetition of what, what Marx said about scientific observation in general. He said that all science is just about relationships between instrument readings, relationships between observables, 
that all science is doing in the end is constructing elaborate mathematical relationships between our sense impressions. Now Lenin objected to this and showing that in the end it reverted to the subjective idealism of Berkeley and ultimately to solipsism. Um, I'm referring to Lenin's criticism and materialism and empiric criticism. Now in the idealist account, it's the observer who collapses the wave function, collapses the wave and turns it into a particle, bringing actuality, bringing actuality to potentiality. But the question is, what is the observer? The immediate intuition you're supposed to get from the reference to the observer is that it's a human being that does this. But if you consider the interference pattern, you could say that the observer was the silver iodide on the film, or the crystals of silver iodide, which when they're hit by a photon turn black. Now, suppose you just let a small number of photons through, or exposed the film for a short period, you will only get a thin speckling of silver iodide crystals turning black. Have they really turned black until someone looks at the film? Is it the person looking at the film which collapses the wave function? But since the crystals on the film are macroscopic objects, objects which could be observed under a microscope or a magnifying glass if you wished. It seems we've, we've turned right back to naked Berkeleyism, where things only exist if a human looks at them. Objecting to this, Einstein remarked, you might as well say that the moon doesn't exist when you're not looking at it. It's an absurd position to take when you consider macroscopic objects like the moon. But where does the, the breaking point come? Why should a crystal of silver iodide be something which only exists if someone looks at it? If you once accept the premise that things only exist when you look at them, you might as well extend it to things of arbitrary size. You might as well extend it to the backside of the moon. Did it even exist before the first uh, lunar, lunar probe took a photo of it? Let's take another example. There's a lot of work going on now to develop quantum computers. And one of the jobs that quantum computers are supposed to be very good at, or in principle should be good at, is factorizing prime numbers, which is a hard, hard mathematical job to do. Certainly if you took a 100-bit binary number and factorized it, that would be something way beyond any human capabilities and would be very hard even for a conventional computer. Now, there exists an algorithm, which Shor's algorithm, which you can use on a quantum computer to do this. If we take the idealist Copenhagen interpretation, if a quantum computer runs this, comes out with the factors of the 100-bit number, the correct answer must be attributed to the observation of this by the human operator who looks at the answer on the screen. Now, there is no way the human operator could actually work out the prime factors of uh, a 100-bit number. So here you'd be attributing to the human observer some kind of supernatural power, a mystical power, which enabled them to select the right prime number by some um, psychic ability. So the uh, idealistic interpretation that was the dominant quantum interpretation from the Copenhagen School 
leads to absurdities and dead ends. But its dominance is a result of the dominance of the Marcus and positivist theory of science in European universities, in physics departments, at the time the people who became the leaders of quantum theory were doing their original undergraduate training. There was, going right back to 1927, a perfectly coherent alternative to the idealist Copenhagen view, which was that developed by de Broglie, who developed a quantum theory of motion whereby a quantum wave going through the slits exerts a force on particles that produces the interference effect. He came up with equations of motions for particles in the wake of this quantum wave, which has them following these wiggly courses. They seem absurd courses to us since we're used to things going in straight lines. But what he was saying is that there's additional forces exerted on tiny particles by the quantum waves. And these quantum waves cause them to deviate from a straight line path. And the path that they end up in actually are the paths which give rise to the interference fringes on the film. Now, this theory was further developed by Bohm in the 50s, and there are now many textbooks on it. I'm giving an example of Jean Brickmont's textbook here. In the Bohm de Broglie theory, particles have definite determinate positions. It's not like the idealist theory where particles have no position until we observe them. Any non-local effects come about through the interference of the waves, which then act as forces moving the particles into the positions we see them. Here's another textbook, um, Quantum Theory of Motion. The, these theories are, are actually quite hard going because they rely heavily on fairly abstract forms of classical mechanics, which um, if you haven't been taught them, take quite a while to take in. The actual um, development of this Bohm theory was strongly influenced by Einstein, who had been very critical of the elements of subjectivism that he saw in the Copenhagen interpretation. In the start of the 1950s, Bohm had written a standard textbook uh, which was entirely within the framework of the Copenhagen interpretation. Einstein read it and asked Bohm to come and discuss it with him. And over a series of conversations, he persuaded Bohm that this in idealist interpretation was wrong. He taught me out of it. I'm back where I was before I wrote the book, said uh, Bohm after meeting Einstein. A year later, around the time he was sacked from Princeton and ex exiled to Brazil for being a suspected communist, he came up with a set of papers that built a new theory of mechanics, an extension of the de Broglie theory. It's not clear how much he knew of de Broglie in 1952 and how much it was an independent invention or how much it was just a recapitulation of de Broglie. Now this wouldn't matter if it were not for the fact that recent experiments have shown that you actually do get the trajectories projected by, uh, predicted by the de Broglie and Bohm theory. This is a uh, 2016 paper showing photon trajectories. And you can see they 
in fact don't follow straight lines, they follow the kind of curved paths that give rise to interference effects predicted by the de Broglie-Bohm theory. So, in conclusion, what I'm saying is that the apparent quantum challenge to materialism was just a dressing up of pre-given Machis prejudices, which the physicists who first developed the um, quantum theory had been inculcated with during their training. The same prejudices that initially caused physicists in Germany to reject Boltzmann's atomic theory. Since 1927, there has been a deterministic theory of motion, the de Broglie theory. This theory has led to fruitful results. Um, I'm not going to explain them at the moment, but Bell, the guy who invented Bell's inequality, was a Bohmian. And from Bell's inequality has followed the harnessing of non-locality to things like quantum encryption. The rejection of Bohm's theory was not due to science, but among other reasons, the fellow physicists like Oppenheimer at Princeton said they weren't, weren't interested in, in, in Bohm's theory because he, by that stage he was regarded as a Marxist, a fellow traveller, traitor to the USA. In addition, of course, you have the fact that established professors would find it very hard to accept a paradigm shift. If they had been lecturing for 20 years on the Copenhagen interpretation, they were not going to enjoy someone coming up and saying, well, some of your basic assumptions are wrong. <laughs>